When you realize your own future has gone to shit, all you have left is to live for someone else. How's it going, guys? So chapter 115 of Tokyo Ghoul has come and gone. We gotten to reread the chapter, digest the information that was presented to us within this chapter, and this actually dealt into more of the final fight between Takizawa and Alma and the Kakuja versus the Kakuja. And then we also get that final panel, that final realization that we're gonna be getting in next chapter with Matsuri becoming a fabulous unicorn. He's gotten that sword stabbed right through his head, through his forehead, it's all the way through his skull, and he hasn't even realized what the hell has happened yet, and a lot of us are really looking forward to next chapter. But there's one aspect that I wanna delve into for this video right here pertaining to Takizawa himself and the tragic journey that he's been on. And now, a lot of you, a lot of you guys probably will be saying, well, what, tra what character doesn't have a tragic journey throughout Tokyo Ghoul? And you guys are right. Every character seems to have a tragic journey, but I just wanna actually wanna delve into Takizawa in general, just him right here, because with the revelations and also the confirmation that we got on a theory that Takizawa actually might have been force-fed, you know, his parents when he was actually, you know, being tortured by Kano in between the time skip of Tokyo Ghoul and Tokyo Ghoul Re, that seems to be confirmed in this chapter. So I just wanted to delve back into previous chapters in part one and part two, and just seeing how Takizawa's journey as a character has unfolded and how tragic it has come. And then with how this chapter played out in 115, it seems like his character is coming full circle and he's starting to make the men's, he's not he's not forgiving himself for the crimes he's committed but he seems to be on the path to where he's actually trying to do more good things for someone else so that way it can rebuild his character so I just want to delve right into his character so the first stop we actually got to go on is actually within part one and I'm actually gonna have pictures up in this video just that way you guys can follow along with me and I'll let you guys know where I'm getting these chapter wise and page wise within each chapter so the first chapter we go to is all the way back in part one which was chapter 48 on page 7 and this was actually the first introduction we got of Sado's character now when we first got introduced to his character he's just the typical rookie and he's looking to prove himself within the organ organization he's He's, he's a investigator, he's a rank two, so he's just starting out, and he seems just to be, you know, the typical secondary character within the series. Like, he, as we come to learn from his character, you know, he looks up to Arima and Amon, and he's wanting to prove himself within the CCG, and he's just your typical character, but as his character gets introduced more and more, and the chapters go on, we get to see his relationship develop with not only with his mentor Hoji, but also Mr. Shinohara with Juzo, and also Amon himself, but then we actually delve into chapter 81. Now, now this is where the dynamic of his character starts to get more fleshed out because when you actually look at his character and Akira gets introduced, this is where I think it gets more interesting for his character because this actually delves more into, you know, his over overall jealousy towards Akira because she's always number one and he's always number two. And this actually goes into his inferiority complex to where he's always second best. He's never, you know, the first, he's never gotten first place and it shows that his character wants to strive to be the best, but it seems like no matter what he does, he can never do that. And this is actually even foreshadowed and actually mentioned within part two of a Tokyo Ghoul Re when, you know, Sado becomes a ghoul and then he's actually being compared to Kaneki slash Heisei because Kano is basically views that as his masterpiece. That is the perfect combination when he did his artificial ghouls with his experiments and Sado is seen as the second, you know, masterpiece. He's a complete ghoul and for him, he's now being compared to Kaneki and throughout his fight with Heisei in the auction raid, we actually get to see that inferiority complex sprout out once again because not only is he actually comparing himself and looking back to Akira but then he's also you know looking at Heisei and saying like I'm going to be better than you and this is where his inferiority complex actually just like takes on a whole new meaning in his ghoul persona so but it's very interesting too going back all the way to part one just with Akira in general the relationship that he has with Akira is very interesting and I love the dynamic that they actually have you know going back and forth as they're talking with one another and just the interactions and the arguments that they have and you can tell that there there's some feelings there and as chapters have gone on we can tell that with Sado, he does have feelings for Akira as a character, but, you know, he's just never had the chance. He's always second best, and no matter what he does, he seems to always lose out in the end. So that's with that, but I think the major, major point that I want to talk about within this video is actually dealing with the revelations we got with his parents, because if you go all the way back to chapter 123, this is a very Sado-centric chapter, and it's called Homefront, and you actually go on the first page of this panel, 
Sato is being sent home and a lot of people are, you know, signing off their like suicide notes or at least the letters they're going to leave behind to loved ones. And they're sending Sato back to his home to where he can spend time with his mom and dad, but his dad is gone at this moment and also his sister. And it's very interesting too because I totally forgot that he actually had a sister in the first place. I knew about the, the parents, the mom and the dad, and just the relationship and also the dog that he has waiting for him at home. And we just get to see, you know, his dynamic as he's living through uh, mm. at home. And it's just very interesting to see, you know, that he's being forced to basically reconnect with his family right before he goes off and, you know, shit happens to him later on in Tokyo Ghoul. But then later on in this chapter of 123, when you get to page 17, this is where you actually get to see his character break down because he actually does not want to die. And there's actually like really cool panels right here of him, you know, crying in the corner. And in the page before this, he writes down on his note, basically saying, I don't want to die. And this actually foreshadows a lot about his character because he's fearful of ghouls and he's fearful of dying. And he just has so much that he wants to accomplish, but he's not able to do that. And like, even though he wants to prove himself, he's a scared character and he's emotionally unstable in a way too. And it's just interesting to see as his character, you know, goes through the auction raid, he actually, puts himself out there and actually, you know, puts himself above all of his subordinates to where he doesn't really care what happens to him as long as other people are safe. And, you know, with the events that happened in the auction raid to where uh, Tatsura and Noro show up, you know, uh, they go after him because Hoji was his mentor, his leader, and, you know, shit happens to him. He loses an arm and then we didn't hear about him. We thought he died until Tokyo Ghoul Re showed up in the auction raid where he only he came back as the owl, as Takizawa the ghoul. And it's just very interesting to see that, like, the thing he feared the most, that's what he ended up becoming, and he just embraced it and actually broke within the prison that Kana was holding him in. Now, we didn't actually get to see a lot about, like, what happened to Takizawa within that prison when he was being held and turned into a ghoul until these most recent chapters where we started getting flashbacks of his time spent also with Amon in that whole, like, containment. But what this chapter revealed, and I actually, I have a chapter where this is where the speculations actually started to come up. If you go all the way back, to the end of the auction raid, it's actually probably the last uh, chapter that pertains to that Pacific arc. You go to chapter 31 of Tokyo Ghoulry, right on page one. This is when Haize is about to fight Takizawa. He's embracing, you know, his Kaneki side, and they're about to be going in. But it's in this first page where we actually see uh, Takizawa within his half Kakuja mode. He's starting to go a little bit crazy because, you know, half Kakujas are just have a very unstable mental state. And it's this dialogue right here is basically where that whole theory and speculation started from. I'm going to read it right here. Mommy, Daddy, I'm sorry. I can't help it. I couldn't help it. And then he just continues to scream and he's in agony in the half cock of state. And this is where a lot of people started to form their theories that what if Takizawa was actually force fed and was actually forced to eat his parents while he was under the care of Kano within his lab. So this was all the way back in chapter 31. And if you actually come all the way back to the most recent chapter, it seems to be true. And uh, like, I'm just amazed at how Ashida is able to foreshadow these stuff so early on. He has it so planned out and it, he's just a master craftsman. But with the first page of the most recent chapter, 115 Question Child, we see Kano basically, you know, force feeding him meat. He's telling him to eat. And sato has got this like, Terrible, terrible look to him. He's so disheveled. He seems to be like withering away and he's just like in a crazed, like looking off in the distant state. And Kano's just basically talking to him and he's like, the thing you just ate, what sort of meat do you think it was? Did it taste like home perhaps? So then this is when the revelations comes in. And then this is where it just like shows the tragic journey that Takizawa has been on, even on and off panels as we've like come to delve more into that time skip period to where Takizawa was actually being morphed into a half ghoul. And just to see what he had to go through, because I can't imagine what this would do to someone psychological wise, like knowing that you just were force fed to eat your parents. And the only thing I can like really compare it to is like if anyone has watched South Park, there's an episode of South Park where Cartman actually force feeds another kid who was bullying him, you know, his parents. It's a, it's a very dark subject, but just to see how like, just look at his face on page one when he's looking at the meatball that has an eye coming out of it. Like you, you can see how distraught and destroyed he is knowing that the fact that he probably just ate his parents and this just contributes to his overall mental breakdown to where, as he says later on in this chapter, Takizawa Sato died in this prison. And he formed this new persona of Owl, the ghoul half of himself, where he kind of like embraced that and that was his new identity. This is kind of like how Kaneki like got rid of the black hair and the white hair persona took over and that was the new Kaneki form. Like you can say that this is the same thing for Sato in this situation. And just to see how 
with him battling Amon and wanting to actually live for someone else. Like he cares a lot about Akira and he actually know and he knows that uh, Akira cares a lot about Amon and he'll do anything in his power to make sure that Akira is happy and content. And if that means bringing back Amon into the fold to make sure that he's okay and Akira can actually have be able to reconnect with her former mentor and, you know, love interest. Like, that's just something that he sees that that is his mission. That's what he has to do. And that's where that line comes where he actually says, when you realize your own future's gone to shit, all you have left is to live for someone else. And that's what he's doing right now. And this is where his character's kind of coming full circle. He's embracing the fact that, yes, he's done some fucked up shit, but he's going to be making amends to it moving on. He's not going to forgive what he did, but he's actually going to be moving forward and, you know, helping his former... Uh, investigator com comrades and also friends in the process and I just really like how Ishida has just molded this character in, in the beginning to where he was just introduced as this simple secondary character you know he was just there he was the rookie very innocent and just the character growth and development that has gone on throughout every chapter is just truly astounding and I really can't wait to see what Sato does later on in future arcs of Tokyo Ghoul Re now that we know that he Got Amon safe. They're going to be heading back to Goat and Kaneki, and we're going to have that reconnection of Akira, Amon, and Takizawa. And I really can't wait to see the dynamic interactions and discussions that they're going to be having later on down the road. So that is the majority of the stuff that I just want to talk about within this. I know that there's going to be plenty, plenty of more that show up within this chapter and or in future chapters to come. And I'm just really, really impressed. But just saw how Takizawa's character has morphed and just changed over the course of this story, and it's very interesting. So I hope you guys have enjoyed my little discussion. I definitely want to hear from you guys. What do you guys think of Takizawa's overall growth throughout the series? Like, with the pictures and all the stuff that I mentioned of past chapters, where do you see, like, the growth has been the most? And do you guys agree with me that Takizawa's character, yes, it's been a tragic journey, but I love the story that it's been on, and even though, like, some moments are, like, terrible and fucked up, it's like his character growth from being just a secondary character being introduced into a character that we've come to simply Sympathize with and actually root for coming versing Amon is truly astounding. So leave your thoughts in the comments below uh, what you thought about the overall chapter of 115, but also of Sato himself. And I'm going to be doing a lot more of these discussion videos because I actually really enjoy just delving back into past chapters and just looking at how Ishida has laid the groundwork for certain characters and certain arcs and certain events. And it's just amazing how Ishida is able to do all this. So if you guys want to catch any more of that content that I'm going to be doing, you can just subscribe to my channel. I love talking with all of the Tokyo Ghoul fans, and I love talking with you guys down in the comments. It's just a lot of fun, and I love like what we get to talk about just in theories and discussion-wise. So I definitely look forward to your guys' thoughts on what it is I just brought to the table with past chapters and this old discussion of Takizawa's tragic journey. So that's going to be it for this video. Again, comments down below, and subscribe to my channel if you guys are fans of Tokyo Ghoul. And let, just give me your thoughts on the overall character and just where you think his characters gonna be going in future arcs down the road so that's it for this video guys and until the next chapter and discussion that i do for tokyo ghoul i'll talk with you all then all right guys see you later